Good morning, everybody. My name is Dariusz Kozerawski. I'm acting Rector Commandant of the National Defense University. I'm professor of the uh, university. And I, I would like to warmly welcome our distinguished guest, Mr. Diamond Wilson, sir. <laughs> he took invitation from our site, from our security forum. I would like to welcome our distinguished guests from the our institutions, which have been cooperating with the National Defense University. I would like to say that, especially, I would want to, I would, I want to say to the our distinguished guests that you are in the very special place. Only in the one place in Poland, we have been educating the officers in the strategic and operational level. Its place. This is the National Defense University. Welcome to the all personnel. I would like to say a few words concerning uh, person and abilities of our distinguished guest. Mr. Diamond Wilson is an American foreign and public policy advisor and currently the executive vice president at the Atlantic Council of the United States. He has a, a long and true experience in defense policy, in particular the NATO and U.S.-European relations. He worked for the NATO Secretary General as a Deputy Director of the Private Office in 2007. He was Executive Secretary and Chief of Staff in the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad. During President George W. Bush's second term, Mr. Diamond Wilson served as a Senior Director for European Affairs at the National Security Council. In 2009, Mr. Wilson became director of the International Security Program at the Atlantic Council, and since 2011, he serves at this current <coughs> position. Mr. Williams' achievements have been remarked and awarded by a number of Central European heads of states, among whom the President of the Republic of Poland due to his efforts to advance transatlantic relations. And after this brief introduction, uh, I want to say a few words uh, with the Atlantic Council of the United States as a think tank of the higher level advisory in the foreign and public policy areas and organization based in Washington, the Atlantic Council operates, operates not only in but also outside of the United States with the officers in Europe and one of them in Walsall. The moderator of our today's meeting will be professor of our National Defense University, professor of the defense, uh, National Defense Faculty, Mr. Professor Richard Spira. <laughs> and uh, the agenda of our meeting is that uh, our distinguished guest will give us the paper, very synthetic. Uh, Later, you will have a possibility to ask our speaker about the problems, especially strategic aspect and the others, if you want. Don't forget th uh, that we have uh, academic freedom in, in the best place, best place for the good strategic discussion directly connected with the all topics and aspects which will be touched by the speaker. Richard, please take the microphone. And now, shortly, the floor is yours. Later, it's a time for our speaker. Thank you for your attention. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. I want to thank the, the rector, Commandant, um, C Colonel, uh, Colonel Professor uh, Kozarowski. Thank you very much for your hospitality. Thank you for the moderation as well, uh, Professor Spear. Looking forward to this. Um, it's a real pleasure to be back in Poland. It's a real honor to be here at the National Defense University for this conversation uh, about a strategy for Europe's East, the way forward after the NATO summit. Um, I'm delighted to be here in part uh, and thank the U.S. Embassy for helping to bring me to uh, to Poland. I'm here with uh, Keisha Lafayette from the Embassy and I've worked closely with Ambassador Steve Mole. Uh, we've got a terrific ambassador here uh, running the show for the United States. Uh, but I'm also uh, pleased to be joined by Michal Kobosko, who runs the Atlantic Council office here 
in Warsaw and really helps to run our Wroclaw Global Forum, where I hope to see many of you next June, a place where we try to bring all of these issues together with Americans, Poles, and other European counterparts uh, to debate the future of this region and of security. But I'm particularly pleased to be here today. Uh, I've had the opportunity, whether it's been at the White House or at the embassy in Baghdad or in Kabul, to work with Polish officials, Polish diplomats, politicians, military leaders. And importantly, among those allies of the United States in each of these settings, Poland, the Polish officials that we've had the opportunity to deal with have always come to the table as real strategic thinkers, helping us think through the real challenges that we're facing, but also bringing a degree of real operational effectiveness, particularly on the battlefield as well. And so it's a pleasure for me to be here to have this conversation with you uh, who are going to be playing such a critical role in Poland's national security. Um, it's also a particularly interesting time to be back in Poland, a time of transition. Uh, your prime minister has uh, gone on to other bigger and greater things, so you're going through your own degree of transition here. But it's also in the wake of a period in Europe that's been pretty tough for many of your European allies and European partners. And yet over the same period of challenges, the Polish economy has grown about 20%. Some are even asking if this is indeed, if Poland is entering another golden age, a golden era for Poland. So I think the answer to that lies in part to what we're going to talk about today. It lies in the outcomes of the NATO summit to some degree. Uh, more importantly, what's happening to your east and Europe's east and directly related to that, to the challenge that we're facing from Mr. Putin. So the thesis I want to discuss with you today is that I'm worried that NATO cannot be secure by protecting only its own. And that if we reinvigorate the NATO alliance, which we are doing and we need to do, but if we do that in isolation, we may just perhaps fail in that task. We can't afford to have clarity in our strategy towards NATO allies combined with a lack of clarity, a lack of strategy about what we do in Europe's east, to the east of Poland. We may be facing a situation that we may look back on Wales and see that this was the turning point where we really began to see a permanent gray zone establish itself to Poland's east, where 75 million people perhaps left in a gray zone. And if that's the case, we may be headed for years of instability, years of, of conflict. And I think that's something that we want to avoid. And so the core, the, the case, that the result, this is the result of, I think, understanding the challenge that we face uh, from Putin's Russia today. And it's not just a challenge to Ukraine. It's not just a challenge to the East. But it's a challenge to the West, the community that Poland's a part of, um, to NATO and the European Union in particular. And therefore, I'd like to argue that we need a comprehensive strategy, not only to deter Putin's aggression, and we're not there yet, but to think about how we lay the groundwork to restore a more positive strategy that advances our interest in a Europe that's whole, a Europe that's free, and that is at peace. So that that statement, a Europe whole, free, and at peace, is not just rhetoric, um, it's not just vision, but it's actually strategy. For 25 years, this had been our strategy, a Europe whole and free and at peace that we pursued through a deeper partnership with Russia, through outreach to former adversaries that became allies, through the process of enlargement of both NATO and the European Union, and through deeper integration itself here in Europe. Well, that strategy has hit a dead end right now because of what's happening in the Kremlin. And so we have to think about right now, how do we consolidate the gains that we've had over the past 25 years? Poland's a great example of that. Prevent the rollback of freedoms, rollback of freedoms in the East, and set the stage for the next phase of integration over the longer term in Europe. So let's take a, let's take a moment to look at the NATO summit in Wales. And I think the context of this summit was quite important. Leaders were gathering at a very historic time a time when NATO's largest and longest operation was coming to a conclusion in Afghanistan, where the arc of crisis buffeting the alliance was intensifying if you look to the south, Iraq, Syria, and Libya, but it had extended to the east, Ukraine, a point, case in point. 
And it was also the, against the backdrop of the beginnings, of beginnings of a tentative economic recovery here in Europe. But it was also happening, this summit was taking place when there were looming and larger questions about the role of the United States and our allies in the world today. Um, on the back of a strategy where the United States has looked to Europe to step up and play an ever greater role within the alliance as the United States tackles issues in the Middle East and uh, Asia, a real emphasis on increased burden sharing. And it had an urgency thanks to Mr. Putin and thanks to ISIS uh, in Iraq and Syria. And so in some respects, this summit was a turning point summit for the alliance. It does, I think, signal the most important adaptation since the end of the Cold War, a NATO 4.0, if you will. The first NATO we all understood during the Cold War was a NATO of deterrence, deterring the Soviet Union during the Cold War. The second post-Cold War was a, a, an, an alliance focused on outreach, outreach to the East, partnership that led to enlargement, Poland case in point. NATO 3.0 is really the operational alliance, first with operations in the Balkans, but since 9-11, Afghanistan, many other places as well. And I think what Wales signaled, signaled is a new NATO 4.0, one that on the one hand is a NATO that goes back to basics, the core of Article 5, collective defense uh, of its own allies, but one that can't be confined to the basics, an alliance that is now a heavily networked alliance that increasingly is the hub of a global security network. And these decisions fell into three important baskets, if you will. The first is the one that I think has the most direct ac applicability here, uh, the Readiness Action Plan, RAP. It could be the most significant shift in NATO forces since the Cold War. A, a reinvigoration of a NATO response force, now what we call a spearhead force, a very high readiness force, um, and importantly to that, connected to a new command headquarters here in Poland that unlike any other NATO headquarters for the first time will be focused on Article 5, on collective defense, not on operations outside of Europe and on the territory of a new member, if you will, not so new anymore. And the third part of this is really a forward deployed, forward deployed forces and assets so that for the first time we have a continuous air, land, maritime presence and a meaningful military activity on a rotational basis on the territory of the Baltic states, Poland, Romania. Um, and this is playing out today, I think, as you have well seen. <clears throat> and so part of the issue of the re response force is to actually be able to address any kind of strategic surprise, to have the capacity to deploy quickly. But it requires time, resources, it requires implementation. The second part of this summit outcome was one related to defense investment. And the premise of the transatlantic bargain essentially was on the table, that if the United States is going to commit more to Europe's defense, Europe needs to commit more to Europe's defense. And if the absence of this, if the burden sharing arrangement isn't addressed, you're going to have a hard time keeping the United States committing resources to European defense if Europeans are having a difficult time committing their own resources. And so the summit was significant. It began here with President Obama announcing the European Reassurance Initiative in Warsaw, a billion dollars in new investment to sustain American security engagement in the East, coupled with Poland standing up and saying that it would commit 2% of its gross domestic product to defense spending. This has led to the NATO summit in Wales to be the first time since 2006, the first time since the Great Recession, that we see a renewed commitment to defense spending and while it's not everything we want to see, it is as if the Allies walked up to the cliff, looked over the cliff, and decided that this was a scary thought to be cutting their investments so much. And for the first time, we have upward war momentum where the Allies have committed to try to reach 2% of their spend, uh, to spending 2% of their economic output on military expenditures within the next decade, and to invest 20% of that in defense investment. The test of whether this has really been a wake-up call will be the follow through, follow through. And the third set of issues at the, at the summit that played out was this issue of global partners. The idea of connecting this alliance to those countries that have the political will, the operational connections, and the capacity to engage in military operations with the alliance. Sweden, Finland, Georgian, Georgia, Jordan, Australia. These countries took, took a step forward in becoming more integrated into NATO planning and exercises, 
and we opened up a larger platform to many more allies, moving away just from a sense of geography to those that are most capable. This has long-term implications because what it does is it is setting the alliance, setting NATO, the standards of NATO as the global standard for those countries that will ever have to fight militarily with the United States and our allies. It's a long-term investment in the relevance of the alliance. But I think one of the things we have to face about Wales is that it's true. Uh, Putin's land grab in Crimea, destabilization of eastern Ukraine, it's prompted NATO to reconsider 25 years of military planning in which we assumed Russia was no longer an adversary. NATO defense posture is now having to take Russia as a potential adversary. NATO's moving forces to the east, it's recommitting to training and exercises, it's making sure that there's more investment in military spending. We have a readiness action plan to convince Vladimir Putin that there's no chance of success if he picks a fight with a NATO ally. But at the same time, and this is my concern, at the same time the alliance has made it crystal clear to non-allies such as Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia, and even Sweden and Finland, that they are on their own to some degree if Russia picks a fight with them. So Western decisions may reinforce the credibility of NATO's Article 5 guarantee attack, that an attack on one is an attack on all, but we may be inadvertently reinforcing a dividing line on your eastern border between those nations within NATO and those nations to its east, and the consequence of enjoying clarity for our strategy with allies while having no clear strategy with non-allies is unfortunately to be, I think, greater instability and insecurity in Europe. And this is where I think we have to face the challenge that we see coming from Vladimir Putin. He's leading a resurgent Russia, taking more aggressive actions against its unprotected neighbors, and even as Putin himself casts aspersions on the Bolsheviks, he follows in their tradition as well as in those of the expansionist czars. Much like Stalin, Putin has seek, seeks to act against soft targets where he can. And today's soft targets are those nations that stand between NATO and the European Union in the West and Russia in the East. His annexation of Crimea is the first territorial land grab in Europe since World War II. Yet it is the natural outcome of his policy of fueling Russian revanchism and nationalism. Putin has been clear and consistent, even if we've not wanted to hear him. The Kremlin has meticulously laid the groundwork for today's actions. Since 2008, in 2008 then, President and Putin proxy Dmitry Medvedev, he spelled out a doctrine of privileged fear of interest in which Russia reserved the right to exert influence over those nations of the former Soviet Union. The Kremlin sharpened this policy with an explicit commitment to defend the rights not only of ethnic Russians, but also Russian speakers residing outside Russia's border. And Putin laid the conceptual groundwork for this new ideology, an ideology of ethno-nationalism, um, orthodox traditionalism, um, that stymied any and stymied any diplomatic efforts to resolve territorial disputes, whether they were Moldova's Transnistria, the Georgia's Abkhazia, or South Oss Ossetia and sustaining the rationale to maintain Russian forces as peacekeepers on their territory and guaranteed that these, these conflicts had no diplomatic solution. And all the while, we saw Russia beginning to distribute passports beyond its borders, developing contingency plans to act, uh, in, to, act to occupy its neighbors, specifically Georgia, Crimea, fueled by petro-rubles. Putin patiently rebuilt Russia's military strength at home he reinvested in the military and prepared to strike when opportunities presented themselves. And we saw in 2008 at the Bucharest summit that he was emboldened, emboldened when he saw success that neither Georgia or Ukraine could receive a membership action plan, if you will, to begin the path towards the alliance. He even stood before NATO leaders, and I was at that summit scoffing at the idea of a sovereign independent Ukraine, specifically singling out Crimea and through a series of actions laid out an escalatory path that led, as we well know, uh, to the war in Georgia. And in some respects, Crimea played out in the same playbook with important differences. He moved very quickly with the collapse of the Yanukovych government, quickly and decisively, but subtly, at first to capture Tr Crimea in a remarkable 20 days annexing uh, the peninsula. Emboldened by the success, he moved into the rest of the Ukraine 
and tried to engineer what was called the Russian Spring at the time in eight regions of Ukraine, from Kharkiv in the northeast to Odessa in the southwest. The Kremlin ideologues began to lay out this concept of a Novorossiya, or a new Russia, that united all these areas, laying the groundwork either for potential separation or independence or annexation. And when this didn't quite work, we saw the Russians pour in these political tourists. But Putin miscalculated. While a few thousand pensioners and veterans joined in some of the protests, they didn't spark sustained protest across the south and the east of Ukraine. They lacked the authenticity of the Euromaidan. Without the failure, with the failure of Eastern Uprising, Putin began phase two, introducing Russian special forces and military personnel to Slavyansk, establishing a base from which to destabilize the rest of the Donbass, preventing credible elections from taking place. Led by Russian citizens, publicly acknowledged Russian officials in the military and intelligence service, these separatist ranks grew and have led to the conflict in the East as we've seen. Um, but Putin began the third phase of destabilization, the subtle invasion of Eastern Ukraine with the introduction of major weapon systems, T-64 tanks, advanced Grad missile systems, while still seeking to cloud their origins. And then we saw thousands of Russian troops come across the border and essentially a full-scale invasion. So we should be under no illusion that what's playing out in Ukraine is the last move. Um, we can expect potentially even more brazen moves in the absence of a coherent strategy. He'll calibrate, step back, let the pressure off a little bit, try to get the sanctions rolled back. But in the absence of a, a strong Western response, we're, at, we're likely to see more more take place. And he's not likely to challenge NATO militarily with an incursion into the Baltic states. But we should expect potentially a more sophisticated campaign, sophisticated campaign to destabilize the Baltic states using money, media, to influence these nations, provoke and incentivize ethnic Russian populations to challenge or even take control of state structures. He'll also continue his effort to try to penetrate and divide those within Europe such as Hungary and Bulgaria, where Russia systematically has bought up the energy infrastructure, trying to sow the seeds of dissent within Europe and within NATO. The possibility of Anschluss with Belarus, land grabs in Azerbaijan or Kazakhstan exist, but the most vulnerable are those that still try to join the West. I think that would be Moldova and Georgia. And in each case, we can expect him to try to undermine those governments to fail. We're even seeing the strategy play out as he moves, as he heads to Belgrade and Serbia this week to underscore that he's not backing off of the Balkans and is committed to disrupting their path towards a Europe whole and free. So what is this? What is Putin's strategy? What's playing out? This isn't about Crimea. It's not just about Ukraine. He is tearing up a post-Cold War order that provides the security and stability that our forces have maintained. He's challenging the West. So we have enormous security interests at stake. It's clear that he's first used the crisis to consolidate control at home in Russia, create a more authoritarian Russia in which he has control. He saw and was frightened by the protesters on the streets of Moscow in December 2011 by those in the Euromaidan. That's an anathema to his rule in Russia. He's used this to dominate his neighbors as part of uh, tactics of coercion and, if necessary, dismemberment by scarring and taking territory to ensure the long to over the long term that these countries, Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, that they'll never be joining the West. But he's also using this to restore in some degree a sense of empire, a sense of Russian greatness, but from a negative angle. And he's laying out what could be a degree of a, a new Russian ideology an, based on Russian nationalism and orthodoxy, which is truly an alternative to our approach to the West. But ultimately, ultimately, He's out to divide and destroy, potentially, we have to worry about the unity of Europe, the unity of the alliance, calling into question Article 5 solidar sense of solidarity, supporting anti-EU parties within Europe. The effect of all of this is an effort to reverse the outcome of the Cold War, of the end of the Cold War, and now to project power for the first time at the heart of Europe in 25 years. And it's the result because of the direction Putin has taken the country in an authoritarian kleptocracy rather than a something to blame our own on. So I was part of a team that actually suffered and failed to deter in 2008 uh, in his, after his invasion in Georgia 
And the question is, will we fail to deter now in Ukraine? We've, got, we've learned some lessons. He will expand his objectives if there's no pushback. And I think that means the biggest determinant of Russians' actions tends to be Western action or inaction. We failed to deter in 2008, and we can't afford to fail again, or we're going to continue to face a series of conflicts and challenges. Therefore, we need a more comprehensive strategy to deter aggression in the East and to lay out a strategy for this region as well. And this begins with what we are doing, but putting it together in a more comprehensive strategic package. We have to raise the cost to Putin and to Russia for his actions. That's the economic sanctions, sticking firm, helping to disrupt major deals, ensuring capital flight, and ensuring, as he will try to undo these sanctions, that they stick until there's a change in Russian behavior. But it's bigger than that. It is recommitting to first principles. Part of the challenge is a lack of ambiguity, there's a sense of ambiguity about where the country of Ukraine and others will go. And are we committed to this idea of a Europe whole free and at peace where countries can determine their own destiny? A recommitment to that vision, I think, is an important part of de demonstrating our determination to stand to this challenge. But it needs to be backed up then by a major strategy to go big on supporting Ukraine so that it doesn't just survive, but it thrives with economic and financial support, and yes, military support to underscore not to escalate the conflict, but to de-escalate, to underscore to Putin that the cost will increase to him if he stays, if he continues to uh, undermine Ukraine militarily. It's part of a strategy not just to re reassure allies, but to revitalize NATO, um, to move more security forces to the east, um, to put many more significant numbers of American forces in the Baltic states, in Poland, and leave it up to Putin to determine whether they're permanent or not, rather than working backwards to try to reassure him that our presence isn't going to be per permanent. It's hardening the soft spots in Moldova, in Georgia, in Azerbaijan. It's responding to aggression in the east by consolidating the south and moving forward to bring countries like Montenegro and Serbia closer to Europe. But it's also expanding the playing field, not letting him think away that he can get away uh, with dominating in Central Asia. And as, even as we draw down in Afghanistan, having a very clear strategy of engagement in Central Asia to help countries like Kazakhstan maintain their sovereignty. It's an energy strategy policy that's threefold, underscoring that the United States is willing to use and harness our prowess and energy security today, working with Europe's effort to diversify its own supplies and sources, and doubling down with Ukraine on its own energy, uh, energy efficiency, increasing its domestic production, so that he's no longer, to hold, no longer able to hold hostage er, Europe on a set of energy issues. This is all achievable, attainable. It's responding to the information wars, not in the same way, but ensuring that we're prepared to help put out the truth against a cavalcade of, of propaganda coming from Moscow. But it's also about confidence in the long term, in our models and our standards. It's why our trade agenda matters. We're trying to negotiate a free trade agreement with Europe right now. We should be very clear that the idea is that agreement will extend to those countries in Europe that have free trade agreements with the EU, meaning Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, are part of our integration and our trade agenda as well. And ultimately, it's about a long-term strategy for Russia. It's about being able to restore this idea of a Europe whole free and at peace in which Russia has its place, in which a different kind of Russia has its place in this community. And so ultimately, it is about a more coherent long-term strategy for post-Putin Russia. So I want to conclude, I want to conclude by underscoring my concern of if we fail to deter Putin's aggression. Many in Washington and, and Brussels today, we want to see this challenge that we're facing as, as, as a real challenge for Ukraine, but not necessarily for us, for our community. We're making sure that Poland, the Baltic states, are safe with our deployments, and that's a very important ingredient. But if you think of what happened, go back to the last day of the NATO summit on September 5th, as NATO leaders were convening in Wales for their final discussions, two days after President Obama left Tallinn, where he went to Estonia to assure the Estonians, we'll defend every inch of your territory, 
an officer in the Estonia, Estonia's internal security service named Eston Kovar, working for the, this was the National Agency for Counterintelligence and Corruption in Estonia. He was leaving a security checkpoint after investigating an incident on the Estonian side of the border at the Luhama border checkpoint. And he was abducted. He was kidnapped into Russia. There's evidence that communications were jammed at the border at that time, that smoke grenades were used to cause confusion. Russian border guards even actually confirmed in the report that there was an incursion before retrench retrenching that. Um, subsequently, this Estonian intelligence officer has turned up in Moscow. He's in Lefortovo prison. We've been, to we've been told that he's declined to have his own lawyer and will use a state lawyer as well. What's happening here? At the same time, right after NATO summit leaders met, the Russians, who have a transit agreement through Lithuania to Kaliningrad, sent a train into Kaunas. And while President Obama was in Estonia, left a train sitting, broken down, protected, in front of Kaunas's largest hydroelectric power plant for hours, causing Lithuanian, for Lithuanian authorities uh, concern about what might happen if there had been little green men inside this train. On September 19th, a week after the summit, Russian, for, Russian uh, uh, naval forces brought into, uh, uh, took out of international waters the Lithuanian fi fishing vessel, the Yaros Vilkas, the Sea Wolf. They towed it into Murmansk. They removed the captain forcibly from the ship, put up $2.3 million euro bond for the release of the vessel, which was twice its price. At the same time, the Russian Duma passed legislation out to prosecute those Latvians and others that at the end in the collapse of the Soviet Union was collapsing those that did not join the Red Army. What's happening here? There's an element of what President Putin, even as he is focused on a war and a crisis in Ukraine, he's picking. He's picking at the underlying sense of security that underpins our alliance, Article 5 collective defense. He's trying to send a signal that, yes, President Obama was there to reassure you that in extremis, in a crisis, with Russian tanks coming to Tallinn, the Americans are there. But it's in extremis. They're remote. It's a 911 call. And every day, what decisions we take in the Kremlin can impact the security, economic well-being of your citizens. And so what I'm trying to argue is we come out of what I think was, in many respects, a successful NATO summit for reassuring and strengthening our security here in Poland, in the Baltic states, and NATO's east. We can't tell ourselves that the alliance is secure if we don't have a strategy towards the east, if we conclude that Ukraine and other countries are on their own. This isn't about Ukraine for Putin. He knows that the strongest check on his power is united Europe and a strong NATO. And so his strategy over time, we have to recognize, has not just been to dominate the neighbors, but has been, been to undermine unity in Europe and to erode that sense of credibility that underpins Article 5, commitment to defend each other within the alliance. And so as we go forward, coming out of Wales, American troops uh, uh, from Aviano and Vicenza arriving here in Poland, F-16s, these are the right steps to take but they'll be insufficient in the absence of a more coherent strategy to deter his aggression in the East and to lay out a more positive future for the vision of countries to Poland's East that doesn't leave them in a permanent gray zone and a permanent Russian sphere of influence. Thank you very much. So, and let me say, sir, as for you, and a big collection of that picture, I hope that it will remind you that time which you spent I would like to give the great thanks to the uh, National Security Faculty personnel, to the Dean, to the other uh, team who has prepared that very interesting event. Have a nice time. See you later. Thank you very much for your attention.